and welcome back. It's pretty tough to implement high availability and fault tolerance if we're not sure what options we have to do exactly that. So from a network perspective, in this video, I'd like to share with you some of the high level concepts and ideas regarding implementing some fault tolerance and high availability. And so right out of the gate, let's just talk about the term HA, high availability. That's normally accomplished by implementing some type of fault tolerance. Think of fault tolerance like uh, having an extra car. And then that way, if your first car doesn't work, you can just get in the second car. Or having multiple rooms. If the first room isn't working, you can use the other room. So fault tolerance often means having two of something. And fault tolerance is one of the techniques that we use to implement high availability. And that way, the network is just always going and always available because of the fault tolerance and the planning that we put in behind the scenes. And of course, the goal of high availability is to make a better experience. So if a customer is paying for a network service or using the network, and it's just always there and always working, we're effectively improving the availability of that network and of the services they're getting by implementing the fault tolerance. And so one of the options that we can use for fault tolerance is at these servers. So let's imagine that we have a network over here, let's draw a little network segment, and we have a group of servers. So let's say it's server A and server B and server C. And let's say we've also synchronized all their content, so it's all identical. So a customer on the internet, the user on the internet, when they access one of those servers, it really doesn't matter which one they access, they're gonna get the same experience. And so here's one of the implementations of making these servers more available to this user in the event we have a failure somewhere in the network. When the user goes to DNS and the user makes a request, and let's go ahead and call it uh, srv1.sample.com. That represents the web server that's being run on all these servers. The result of that DNS request could come back, let's say it's 23.1.2.3. And then once the client gets that IP address, they then send a packet, a TCP SYN request, going to the well-known port. Port 80 if it's HTTP or port 443 if it's HTTPS. And so that traffic at layer 3 is forwarded up to that IP address of 23.1.2.3. However, on our end, instead of having that go directly to one of these servers, we have that go to an intermediate device, and that would be our load balancer. And in the background, the load balancer has been keeping track of these devices, it's polling it, it knows exactly how many sessions each one has, and then the load balancer with this new request from this user could send it to the appropriate server, and that would be based on the rules the load balancer has. For example, uh, a server that's up, that would be great, and also a server maybe that's the least busy, or a server that's optimized to handle the type of browser that the client is using, or if the client's coming in on a mobile device, a server that's been optimized to handle that type of request. So this IP address here is really a virtual IP address that represents one or more of these servers, and then behind the scenes, the load balancer is forwarding it to the actual server. So maybe this is dot eight and dot nine and dot 10 on whatever network that is. And the load balancer can evenly distribute the number of requests across those servers. And if a single server fails, the load balancer, when new requests come in, because it's tracking those servers on the back end, it can forward the new requests to the existing servers. So a load balancer is part of a solution for implementing high availability and fault tolerance and also better performance as well. And that's because we don't have just one server. We have multiple servers and we also could have systems in place that identify how much load overall is being placed on those and we could spin up another virtual server if we needed to, if the load demanded it. All right, so that's one of our techniques in high availability and fault tolerance is to implement a load balancer. Let me clean some of that up. Another technique that's often used is network interface card. That's what the acronym NIC stands for, NIC teaming. And with NIC teaming, if we have a server, let's have a server over here this time, and there's our server and it's connected to the network. Instead of just having one physical interface, we could have two. And instead of going to the same exact switch, perhaps we have one that goes to switch one and we have another network interface card that goes to switch two. And that way, if we lose a single NIC or if we lose a single switch, this server still has access and still can connect to the network and still provide services. Another technique that we commonly use to implement high availability and fault tolerance is the concept of two. And when I talk about two, I'm talking about two default gateways, uh, two firewalls, two, et cetera. And here's an example of that. Let's imagine we have a, a gateway that our clients are using, a router that our clients are using in VLAN 10. Well, if that gateway fails, what does the client do? The client goes hungry, bow, bow, bow. They don't, they don't have a way to get off the local network. So if we use a technique like a first hop redundancy protocol, instead of having the PC point to one of the real IP addresses of one of the layer three addresses acting as a default gateway, we could have them point to a virtual IP address. And then we could have a pair of devices 
who are supporting that virtual IP address. So maybe Core 1 says, I'll take responsibility for that default gateway address, this virtual IP address. And then Core 2 says, cool, cool, you do that. And if you go away, if I don't see you anymore, I'll take over responsibility. And that way we can have some fault tolerance by using two routers with a first hop redundancy protocol to support the default gateway functionality for the client. So in a video or two coming up, I'll go ahead and demonstrate an example of that as well. So let me clear some of that up. And an example of having redundant firewalls and two firewalls would be something like this. So you have basically two firewalls in the path, firewall one and firewall two, and one takes on the role of being active, meaning it's actually doing the work, and the other has the role of being passive. So effectively, one of the firewalls handles all the traffic, enforces all the rules, and the other one simply keeps track of the first one, saying, are you there? Are you okay? <laughs> and if the first one goes away for some reason, the second device here would then take over the active role and start forwarding the traffic. And that would be an example of implementing fault tolerance for a firewall. Another option of that besides doing active-passive is called active-active. And with active-active, one of the firewalls takes a portion of the traffic, and the other firewall takes another section of traffic, maybe from VLAN 20, but at the same time, they're paying attention to each other, and if the other one fails, the one that remains will take over the responsibility for all the traffic. So whether it's active-active or active-passive, the idea there is that we have two devices, two firewalls in this example, that are providing that fault tolerance. And one of the places where we don't have a lot of opportunities to do fault tolerance is at the access layer switches. So if we have an access layer switch, and this is our user here with their Linux computer or whatever it is plugged in, and if this physical switch fails, they're pretty much out of it. Because it's not common for us to have multiple network interface cards at PCs, that'd be an example of NIC teaming, going to two separate physical switches. Now we're going to do that for a lot of our servers and infrastructure devices, but for end users, they, they pretty much have one network interface card going to one switch. And from that perspective, if any of those components fail, they're out of luck until we actually get that corrected. But for the rest of the infrastructure and network, we have a ton of fault tolerance, which allows us to end up with a highly available network. So let me clean up a little bit of that. And regarding et cetera, uh, what else could we do as far as having two? And the answer to that could be sites. So maybe this is our headquarters site right here in our branch offices. And perhaps we have a plan so that if there is a natural disaster or some other huge big problem at one of our sites, we would have a backup site ready to move into. And so we could have a, the physical location only, or we could have the physical location and all the gear. And those extremes would be a cold site where it's just basically the facility, nothing there yet. And at the other end of the spectrum, we could have a hot site, which basically means it's ready to go. It's got the networking, the infrastructure, it's good to go. We just flip a switch and we can start using that hot site. And then in the middle, we have a warm site, which would, <laughs> which would have some of the stuff, but not everything ready to go. So we'll have a separate video regarding sites and some of the considerations regarding which types of sites, because we may not need, you know, a real site, a physical site. We might just have a alternate cloud location that we could use. And then our employees could work from home temporarily or permanently as we do data processing based on cloud services. Hey, thanks for watching and subscribe right here to get the latest information from CBT Nuggets. And if you're new to or considering a career in the world of IT, head on over to CBT Nuggets and sign up for a free trial.